Okay, jokes. Right. Um, well, I am pretty much blown away with the number of people that have logged in. So there's a huge amount of pressure to actually produce something decent. The only saving grace is that nobody's had a drive to go anywhere and you're sitting in your gardens or you've got a glass of wine, hopefully. So that will make it a wee bit easier. Um, I'm Mark Frame. I'm one of the consultants that work up at Southampton General and in the Spire in Southampton and in the Wessex Nuffield. Um, got a practice now that incorporates uh, paediatric soft tissue knee um, in Southampton General and in the Spire. So I thought it'd be quite a good uh, thing to do just to kind of go through a lot of this stuff overlaps with adult, um, but there's some unique things and things that are much more prevalent in kids. Um, so uh, we'll start and go through some of those. So the first case uh, looking at is Jamie. He's a 16 year old. It's given away at the top because I've written ACL. So there's no guessing, there's no prizes for working out what it is. But he's fit and healthy. He's a keen sportsman playing hockey, hockey on um, AstroTurf. Um, and particularly in the old days where he used to play on AstroTurf that was the sand based stuff. It was very, very grippy. And everybody wanted to buy cool boots that um, would help you on the Astro. But actually, they caused a lot of knee injuries. Um, collided with another player, boots gripped on the Astro. He turned, twisted, felt an immediate pop and pain. Um, and it's the classic history, and it sounds like something out of a textbook, but in reality, patients, and you guys know, patients come in and tell you exactly what it says in the textbook, and it always amazes me that they do that. Um, couldn't play on, that's always the one that makes you think that it's an ACL, because somebody who's 16 playing hockey doesn't come off the pitch lightly, um, and he was taken off. Immediate swelling, um, because obviously your ACL is very vascular and you get a knee full of blood. Um, couldn't manage the pain, ended up going on to the minor injuries, given crutches, an x-ray, this sort of picture's pretty typical, you know, somebody takes a quick x-ray, says you've not broken anything, away you go, stick some peas on it, and you'll be fine. Um, over the next couple of weeks, swelling sort of settled, range of motion started to get a bit better, started training again, 16, didn't really want to make a fuss and complain because he wanted to go back and do football. Went back at around about eight weeks, just running for the ball, nothing really complicated. Suddenly his knee gives way again. Not quite as bad as the last time, but ends up with a sore swollen knee the next day. Gives it a rest for a few days, but his mum makes him go to the GP. So what, what happens next? Well, the GP obviously takes a history, and a history like that is really all you almost need. Um, or if they turn up and, and see you guys, somebody's organised some physio separately. Um, you know, when somebody tells you that story, you know that they've got an a significant injury, whether it's an ACL, whether it's a meniscus, whether it's both, but you've got a good idea just from what they're telling you. Um, clinical examination, this is, I was chatting to GPs about this as well, and I think a lot of people get caught up with, you know, all the different special tests and, you know, doing a Lachman's, doing an anterior draw, trying to do a pivot shift, you know, I, I wouldn't get too worried about it because often in the acute stage, these examinations are too difficult to do anyway. And some of them are so, insensitive that even if it's negative or positive when you're doing the examination doesn't really kind of add an awful lot you're still probably going to do some further investigations or you're going to send them on to somebody else because they've got a problem and um, probably the ones that i do think are really important to look for is whether they've got their full range of motion um, and it's important to differentiate between somebody who's just got a stiff sore swollen knee that doesn't want to move versus somebody who's had a couple of weeks bending their knee fine, no real problem, but just doesn't come out to full extension and they've got a block. And particularly in kids, you know, just watch out for the kid that's normally got kind of 10, 15 degrees of hyperextension and the other knee just comes out to full extension, not to be fooled that it's actually not locked when it is. Um, check the ligaments if you can, do some of the tests if you can. I mean, the pivot shift is always one of these ones that seems to snooker everybody. Um, you know, even in clinic, I would say probably about 50% of patients that have got a barn door ACL, you know, you're just not going to elicit a pivot shift. And it's not because you're crap at it. It's because it, patients don't like it. They anticipate that you're going to hurt them. Um, they tense their quads. It's just a difficult thing to, to do on some people. And actually, really, until they're um, asleep, waiting for their ACL reconstruction, sometimes it's the first time I've ever got their knee to pivot. Um, so I wouldn't feel bad about not being able to do a pivot shift or get a pivot shift in somebody. I think probably the, the takeaway from this is anybody that's got 
what looks like and sounds like from their history, a significant knee injury, that probably sending them on and referring them up to the acute knee clinic is almost essential because, you know, there's lots of different things that can masquerade and ultimately the worst case scenario is that you've got somebody who comes and sees us has an MRI scan that's that doesn't show an awful lot and they go away again. I think that I would rather see those patients than find the patient with the bucket handle tear that's three months down the line after you know trying to rehab from it. I think you know anybody that you think or you have a worry or a concern that they've got an ACL injury, they just need referred straight away. Um, <clears throat> you know we've got the direct kind of route um, just through you know on call there's nothing to stop anybody giving us a phone the virtual clinic now is another <coughs> good route um, in uh, where we triage everything that comes in and it's going to become even more important um, with uh, COVID and once we get restarted that um, we try and streamline things so that patients um, get to see us when they need to see us um, you know if it's not particularly acute but you've got a worry about somebody or they've been offered like an appointment for four months down the line, then just take my email address and I'm sure everybody else is the same. I would rather get a quick email from somebody rather than a patient that's unhappy further down the line. So if you've got a worry, there's probably a good reason to have a worry. So just, just uh, offload that and email us. I'm not sure how it works with access to MRI. Um, some GPs can organize MRIs, you know, um, you know, it depends, it depends where you are. If it's possible and it's feasible, then absolutely, <clears throat> you know, almost 100% of these patients, if they've got a significant problem, I'm going to organize an MRI scan. So if you can do that before they come, then it just makes one less appointment for them. And it gives us something um, to go on before they've even come. Um, and if it's something, it's an acute thing, if they've got a bucket handle, they've got something else more significant, it means that we can really expedite them and get them done as soon as possible. If there's going to be a delay, um, you know, do some form of imaging. Uh, you know, an x-ray, although it's not the best, it's absolutely essential because, you know, it's going to be the patient that you don't miss the tibial spine avulsion or somebody who's actually um, knocked a big osteochondral fragment off that's floating around in their knee. And that's an emergency. That's something that needs dealt with straight away and something that can easily be picked up on, a, on an x-ray. Um, so I think that's that's really important. Don't leave somebody for months and months on a waiting list or with rehab or whatever without doing a, a simple x-ray or, or asking the GP to organise a simple x-ray or even the patient to go down and, and request one from their GP. Um, I think it's really, really important. In, in kids, you know, their ligaments are often stronger than their bones and you see these sort of what they're called Meyer McKeever type fractures where they pull off the tibial eminence, they pull off the tibial spine. Um, and increasingly with kids that are doing far more energetic stuff, and as the level of trauma goes up, um, you're seeing kind of femoral avulsions of bone of their ACL. And those are things that we can potentially do something about in an emergency scenario. So an ACL avulsion, you can see these images here. These are two x-rays. Um, and the really important thing to look at is so that top image on the right hand side. Um, you don't get straight lines in humans um, or in x-rays or imaging. So that's a, that's a fluid level. And the reason that's got that level, I'm sure you everybody knows, but it's um, the, where the fracture and where the little uh, round box in the arrow is showing that the tibial spine has been pulled off um, and you've got a fracture. So you get bleeding because you've got the injury, but you also get fat from within um, the bone and they separate out like olive oil and vinegar and you get that uh, very distinctive fluid level that you can see there. Um, the one down below is just a different view of the same thing but again it's quite subtle but something that's unbelievably important because if we can go in and uh, reconstruct that straight away and put that tibial spine avulsion back down potentially we're, we're having somebody that's avoiding having an ACL reconstruction um, and gets away with six weeks worth of uh, rehab versus you know a year with an ACL reconstruction plus the time for rehab before they ever have an ACL reconstruction. Um, the faster we get to do it the better you know I've written three weeks there but actually you know you don't want to do it at three weeks um, you know the sooner the better. Three weeks is just the upper limit of where it suddenly becomes not really possible or it's going to be really difficult to do 
So it's not lingering around for three weeks trying to do something, it's about doing it as soon as we possibly can. So previously, and still in a lot of places, the way that something like this is fixed is they make a great big arthrotomy, you know, a scar this sort of size in the front of their knee, open it all up, put that bit of bone back down and secure it with a screw that's three and a half millimetres uh, thick. So that's not great. Um, you know, you can imagine that there's not really space or, 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 or the place for a screw inside your knee and often these need to come back out with the second operation further down the line. And it's a small, uh, very sort of fragile piece of bone and not infrequently actually just putting a screw through it, it all falls apart. So it's not a fantastic means of fixing things, but it's all people used to have. Now, and what I've been doing um, is doing it uh, with what's called an internal brace. So actually repair that uh, fracture back down using little titanium buttons that we can tension. Um, and then reinforcing that with what's like a, a sort of nylon tape that goes through the, the passage of where your ACL was. And it acts a bit like when we put a plate on a bone to support it and give it primary stability so that any kind of force through your knee is taken through that rather than the damaged ACL and gives it the best opportunity to heal. Um, it's all done arthroscopically um, and pretty minimally invasively now. So this is an example of somebody, these are two, the one on the left hand side is a femoral avulsion. So the ACL has been pulled off from the notch where the red arrow is and we've reattached that. Um, and then where that little titanium button is and where the blue line represents is the fiber tape, which you can see on the right hand image is that kind of blue and white uh, braided tape. Um, and that just suspends across the knee and allows the ACL an opportunity to heal back in without the full force of your knee and your body weight going through it. Um, the one on the, in the middle is the same thing, but the tibial eminence. Um, so we've brought that chunk of bone with the ACL attached back into position. Then we've put the internal brace across and supported it. Um, eventually, obviously the internal brace doesn't need to be there anymore. You don't generally need to take it out the knee, a bit like plates on bones. Once the bone's healed, it's great. The bit of metal can stay there. It's gonna do you more harm to take it out than just to leave it and it doesn't cause a problem. So in this chat, you know, if he's, if he's not got an avulsion, he's not got any other pathology, um, you know, I think it's a really difficult one. And I'm sure a lot of you have, and it'd be interesting to hear at the end, people's kind of uh, how many folk they honestly think get on without um, having an ACL reconstructed. The literature in the past used to sort of quote figures of 50% of people could manage conservatively without an ACL reconstruction. Um, I don't know whether that was in comparison to what an ACL reconstruction at that point could give you versus not having one. Um, but certainly in the younger population and kids in particular who are very fit and very active and want, you know, not 14 to be the last time they ever play football or dance or whatever it is that they want to do, um, very few of them want to give all of that up. Um, so to get back at the level that they want to function, I think the majority of kids um, seem to want to go down the route of ACL reconstruction if they have any symptoms at all. There's very few people that are happy giving up football or giving up dancing. So conservative management is obviously still an option. You've got to counsel your patients, explain to them um, what that involves. It's also important to kind of highlight that if they are going to go back to really active stuff, um, every time that they do something and they actually, their knee gives way or there's a problem, then each episode there's risk to their meniscus. You know, their medial meniscus is the secondary stabilizer for rotation in their knee. And every time that knee subluxes because their ACL is not working, there's always a worry that you end up damaging your medial meniscus. And actually, ironically, I think a big tear of your meniscus in a meniscectomy is probably far more catastrophic in the long term. So, you know, is that a risk that I'd want? Probably not. But, um, you know, everybody's very different um, and every ACL injury is very different. But I think the majority go on to, to ending up with some surgical intervention. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah, of course. Um, and Denise has asked, could you expand on how we access the acute knee clinic, please? Um, so the acute knee clinic really just comes through. Um, Um, so probably the best way of, of accessing it, if you've got somebody that needs to come in either just an, an urgent referral 
um, into um, orthopaedics or you know if you guys could there's no, I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't um, call the on-call um, registrar and explain that you've got somebody that needs to be seen straight away and if it's not something that needs to be seen that day then you know they will put it onto the the fracture clinic and that automatically goes on to the acute knee clinic Um, can I ask a quick question, Charlotte? Um, can you see, it says on my screen that I've been signed out. I take it it's all working okay? Yep, you're fine, you're there. Can you see, you can't see a window in front of the slides? Nope, nothing, just see your slides and the picture of you. Um, I've had another question. It says, yep. is this NHS covered or private? Um, with regards to the different procedures or? I think, yeah, I think it was just what you were talking about. Yeah, so I don't do anything different than I wouldn't do privately or in the NHS. So exactly the same procedure, exactly the same thing, no matter where it is. So it's all about just getting things done properly. So it's not one or the other. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Everything I'm talking about is the same stuff, whether it's NHS private, doesn't matter. So ACL reconstruction, arthroscopic, um, addressing the patient's expectations of what that's going to actually end up like. Is, is really important um, and uh, the majority of ACLs um, are day surgery patients. Um, obviously if you've got a location thing and you're going to be on the Isle of Wight or there's, there's some issue like that then that's different but the expectation for most patients is that it's day surgery. Um, don't come out with theatre with a brace. Um, there are other reasons that you might need one if there's another ligament or there's, there's a meniscal injury but for an ACL uh, there's no braces, no plasters, nothing like that. Um, and patients are fully weight bearing in full range of motion. So I don't really restrict them. The pain is what's gonna give them some restriction. And most patients complain of the pain from the hamstring harvest uh, more than the, the pain within their knee itself. Um, hamstring reconstructions are, are really pretty unanimous and, and the most common. Um, there are other uh, ligaments that we use, you know, patellar tendon, um, hamstrings, uh, and, um, uh, quads tendon was one that kind of came in as slightly popular but its results are pretty poor um, so that's kind of disappearing by the wayside but the mainstay of most uh, reconstructions are, are hamstring tendon. The traditional or most people's ACL reconstructions they normally take both of the hamstrings so semitendinosus and gracilis um, and like I said most patients complain of pain from from the hamstring harvesting um, I do a slightly different uh, technique. So I use the Arthrex all inside technique, uh, which is slightly different. It's much less invasive. Um, the, we don't need to take two hamstrings. We just take the uh, semitendinosus. You don't need to take grassless. Um, and also it doesn't use full bone tunnels. Uh, there are two small sockets that we use and there's no screw fixation uh, for it. So instead of a big interference screw that you'll often see on x-rays, and I'll show you in a minute, um, we've got retro drilled sockets uh, and two suspensory buttons, uh, which means that we can tension both sides, uh, which is just a much uh, cleaner way of doing it um, and much less painful for the patients um, and much less bone loss. Um, and the best way I can explain the, the benefit of doing tunnels that are retrograde drilled and what that means is that instead of drilling from outside into the knee, we're using a special technique where we drill from the inside backwards. And if anybody's done any DIY, which you've probably done recently, is if you ever drill a hole in a piece of wood, the side that you start drilling is a perfect, lovely hole. And the hole on the other side is all kind of blown out and wide. And that's the same thing that happens when you drill bone. So this technique is fantastic because it means that we have that lovely, clean, perfectly shaped hole um, on the inside of the knee where it's really important. So there's lots of different advantages to this, but um, that's just one of them. The rehabilitation, I'm not going to go into too much because that's, that's your job. Um, I'm very, very keen um, for you guys to do what you do best. And um, I, I never really get, um, I don't interfere. Um, it's interesting, I've had lots and lots of emails from physios in different places asking, you know, what do you want? What do you, what do you like? What's this, what's that? Um, you know. Ultimately, I'll do the surgery and you guys can do the rehab. I have some faith and trust that you know what you guys are doing um, and you see the patients for much longer than I do. 
Um, so I think it's really important that um, leave that to, to, to you guys. Obviously, I give patients a quick guide as to the different stages of things, but it'll be interesting at the end if we have some questions. My question to you guys would be, um, you know, if somebody could detail me what they would say is the sort of perfect rehab and what I should be telling patients is happening at different stages. And, you know, is it realistic for somebody to get back at nine months or should it really be 12 months of people pushing it? So um, if somebody wants to kind of maybe jot that down in the questions or, or tell me at the end, that would be, that would be really helpful. Sorry, Mark, another question. Um, what is it about that technique that means you only need single strand hamstring? So traditionally, you wanted four, four strands of collagen um, in the ACL, and we still want four strands of collagen in your ACL. Um, and the way that that happened before was that you would have obviously your grassless folded over and doubled, and then the semitendinosus folded over and doubled, and then pulled through the knee. The issue with that was that you've got semi-T, which is much thicker than grassless. So you're trying to tension two different sized, two different volume tendons. And actually you probably need to tension them separately, which most techniques don't do. So I was always really worried that actually you weren't tensioning them appropriately. Um, with our technique, when you get the semi-tendinosis, you quadruple it. So you fold it and then you fold it in half again. Um, and that gives you enough to be able to use in the socket and it's, there's a perfect socket. In the old technique, I always thought it was incredibly wasteful because at the end of the operation, the last thing you did was cut away the best part of about an inch and a half of this, of this patient's hamstrings and throw them in the bin. Um, you know, uh, So a, a technique that doesn't waste anything and uses just exactly what you need um, and that it has advantages just kind of rang in my head as something that, that was the right thing to do. Don't like throwing away bits of patient that actually, you know, they probably need themselves, you know, there's nothing yet that I've ever found in medicine that the human body has made and doesn't need, no matter what we say, you know, it's like your appendix, you know, you need it. Um, it's amazing how evolution has uh, gone on for millions of years and somehow they've managed to make a bit of your body that you don't need. So it's a load of, load of rubbish. So if we can keep some of you and we don't need to use it, then I don't. Um, so that's the reason.